On today's World Insight, China and the U.S. mark 45 years of formal ties. We speak to American scholars on how to recapture the ping-pong spirit that got the diplomatic ball rolling four decades ago. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Happy New Year to all of you. Today, January the 1st, 2024, marks the 45th anniversary of formal diplomatic ties between China and the U.S. Chinese President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden exchanged congratulatory messages on this occasion. The year 2023 wrapped up with a meeting between Chinese President and the U.S. President at the APEC in San Francisco. But this year, 2024, China-U.S. ties face headwinds, especially as the U.S. presidential election looms. Today, we invite a panel of American speakers who have been both witnesses and participants of building relations for decades between the two countries. They recognize that good China-U.S. ties can better address global challenges, whether they are climate change, economic recovery, or AI governance. They also expressed their hope for more flights and easing visa rules leading to people-to-people -people exchanges. They are generous in both sharing their insights and their personal stories. Here's my conversation with them. Susan, Jeffrey, David, good to see you. Happy New Year to all of you. Happy, happy, New, happy New Year. Happy New happy Year. Happy New Year to you, too. Thank you so much. Uh, we are producing this special program today on the very first day of the year 2024. We purposefully invite the three of you, uh, three Americans who have been in China uh, for a long time and also have been knowing about China and interacting with China for a long time. Um, we hope that you are going to bring to us uh, both the reflections of history and also prospects for the future. We ask all of you to provide some uh, early photos and the latest photos to us uh, about your China relations. Susan, I like your photo, uh, which is uh, at the Le Shan, the big Buddha. Tell me about that trip and your early days with China. Well, I first came to China in uh, 2000 and I came with my family and we were posted. I was a diplomat in the U.S. Foreign Service and we were posted to the U.S. consulate in Chengdu, Sichuan province. And my children were very young. I had a baby who, uh, who was less than a year old and two toddlers. Uh, my husband was a teacher in the school, and we spent all of our weekends traveling around Sichuan province, which is, of course, as you know, a very beautiful place and with very good food. Um, and we just had such a wonderful time there as our, our introduction to China, away from, you know, the East Coast cities that everyone knows so well. Mm -hmm. And years passed by. What is, you know... Uh, your personal reflection upon the decades, 45 years, China-U.S. relations? Well, um, I haven't been involved in all 45 years, but I've definitely been very involved in the last, say, 25. And, you know, my reflection is that this is a relationship that, you know, it, it doesn't come easy, let's just say. It's been ups and downs, constant kind of nitpicking and uh, little problems that come up in the relationship. But what mm. I've seen throughout my time is that, you know, there's a lot of goodwill on both sides to work through these problems and to try to put the relationship on a healthy and a constructive track, which I think is what, um, you know, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, uh, Richard Nixon, Jimmy Carter, all had in mind when they started this relationship uh, back in the 70s. So I think, um, you know, we, it's hard work, but it's definitely very worthwhile and it brings tons of benefits to both sides, both peoples in the United States and in China. 
Jeffrey, thank you so much also for providing us with a wonderful photo of you and your wife at the uh, Confucius uh, commemoration ceremony. Tell us more about your early days in China and your assessment of this relationship so far, 45 years. Well, I'm, I'm going to go back more than 50 years because uh, when I was uh, in school in Detroit, Michigan, and Richard Nixon uh, came to China in that opening uh, of the U.S.-China relations, the Chinese uh, table tennis team uh, came to Detroit in a big, in, in, in a big celebration, and uh, I got to watch more than 50 years ago the world's best uh, table tennis players, uh, and that was my first uh, direct experience of China. But then I first came to China. Uh, in person with my wife in 1981. So uh, this goes back uh, 43 years now. China was uh, still extremely poor. Uh, and uh, I was a first year professor of economics at Harvard University studying international development. We visited uh, that year uh, Guangzhou, uh, Shanghai and Beijing. I saw a lot of poverty uh, and uh, in this remarkable 43 years since, I got to watch the most amazing, dramatic, wonderful economic success story perhaps in history. Uh, and I watched it close up because I've been coming to China uh, typically several times a year uh, for most of the 43 years, and I watched the economic development. My professional lifetime has coincided with uh, my uh, uh, ability uh, to see firsthand this yeah. lucky uh, chance to see firsthand China's remarkable rise. Besides the remarkable rise of China, as you described, what about your personal assessment of China-U.S. relations 45 years? You know, when I first came to China uh, and uh, came many, many times and had many Chinese students and uh, worked with many Chinese colleagues, the relations were very good for most of the time. I think it's only in the 2010s when things uh, started to go sour, which I personally uh, blame on the United States overwhelmingly. I think the United States government just got scared of China's success and that this is the basic problem. I don't see any deep, deep barriers to good relations between the US and China. I think the US just has to get over uh, a kind of uh, fear factor uh, or the US desire to be the, as they say, the world's hegemon or the lead power well, no, China is a success story and the U.S. and China should learn to live together, cooperate with each other, trade with each other, eat good food, uh, as uh, Susan said, and uh, enjoy and learn from uh, each other's cultures also. Um, so I don't see any I fundamental barriers, but I do believe that the United States leadership kind of freaked out about 10 years ago. China is too successful. It's not a view that I uh, agree with at all. David, what about for you? I really appreciate the photos that you sent. The very early days back in the 1980s on the Great Wall, going to the first McDonald's in Beijing um, decades ago, and certainly your photos with your students these days. Tell me more about your personal anecdotes and your personal assessment of these relations between China and the United States. Yes, well, uh, the, just uh, the, since my first contact with China, uh, for me, it was absolutely life changing. I, I came on a, sort of an unexpected opportunity to take part in the translation project at Peking University. And I li knew very little about China. I'd been studying China Chinese for a long time. Uh, but when I arrived in Beijing, I arrived at the same airport that Nixon arrived at, the very earliest one. And as I recall, we were the only flight that night. It was one airplane at that airport. 
And now when I go to, to uh, T3 and T4, and it's this incredible airports, I can't imagine uh, that having just one flight into Beijing on that particular night. I mean, looking at your photo on the Great Wall, it's like an American hippie on the Great Wall in China. <laughs> right. Well, we were all sort of hippies. Uh, it was all about pe peace and love uh, back then. <laughs> And, and, you know, a lot, I, I've personally, the, from people-people to relationships, I've always found a, a sort of a, an affinity between the Chinese people and the American people. I don't know what it is. There's a, a kind of a chemistry there where we, we just bond and we get along dis, despite our, mm -hmm. our differences. Uh, I would say probably the biggest change that's happened, uh, in, uh, on not just economically and also uh, technologically, is, uh, is the sort of the knowledge dissymmetry or asymmetry. When I came there, uh, I was, uh, I knew something about China, had read many books. They also knew something about the United States, but we were both kind of uh, sort of uh, approaching each other with a lot of ignorance and a lot of misunderstanding or just a blank slate almost. Nowadays, my students know more about the U.S. than I do. <laughs> I mean, especially even pop culture and all sorts of scandals and everything, they know, they know much more than I do. I think that the strength of the U.S.-China -China relationship uh, is very strong at the people-to-people -people level, definitely. I don't think that people, even nowadays, despite uh, all the, the, the recent diplomatic crises and all, all the, the sorts of st uh, strife and hype that has gone on, I have never at any moment seen a, a, this, a similar kind of rift uh, between the average Chinese and the average American, such as myself. There may be the extremes on both ends, but... Uh, Maybe I shy away from them or they shy away from me, but I've never met a Chinese person who, because I was American, felt some kind of animosity, almost never. So I, I, think, I think that's the basis upon which we need to build going forward. And right now we're at a crisis point because you may have noticed there are many, many hundreds of thousands of Chinese in the U.S. And this uh, last couple of years, there have only been 300 or so Americans studying in China. That's a fearful asymmetry that we have to address. One of the things many people have been talking about is what about now? Uh, I guess that's also the point that why we are gathering here today. Susan, to you, um, how do you see both sides following up the promises and also the interactions uh, at the uh, San Francisco meeting? Well, it's a great question. I think uh, when we look back at 2023 in U.S.-China relations, it was a bit of a difficult year, I would say. Um, you know, we started off in, with a crisis over this uh, balloon incident. We had a complete cutoff of communications. And then I think relations got to such a low point that people really started to get worried about the tensions in the relationship and whether things would spin out of control. And at that moment, you saw a pullback, I think, on both sides and the sort of restart of high-level diplomacy, a lot of high-level channels being reestablished, working groups being reestablished, and of course, leading up to the leaders meeting in San Francisco. And I think coming out of that, there was this commitment to try to stabilize the relationship and keep it kind of steady, knowing that in 2024, with the U.S. presidential election coming, it's going to be uh, a little bit difficult to control every single aspect of the relationship. And here, I just want to say that we should not underestimate the effect of COVID-19 and the damage that that did to the relationship. I think it was a horrible time for something like that to happen. Of course, it was a terrible um, event. It was traumatic, I think, for our two societies and for the whole world. And to not have communication for three years between the U.S. and China has really set us back a lot, and we have to make up for that. But uh, it's it's not going to be an easy year. But I think we can we can get through it if we work if we work at it. And I think that there is determination on both sides to do that. I don't think that uh, <laughs> that that the situation is very constructive. Uh, we'll be in a uh, in an election year in the United States, and many politicians will compete to show who is tougher on China. So this will become a domestic political game. And I regard the whole crisis as a bit of a game. You know, both sides are taking measures to decarbonize the uh, economies, but the cooperation between the two 
is not very meaningful right now. Uh, in fact, the United States is very protectionist, saying don't buy things from China, don't buy electric vehicles from China, don't buy uh, other parts of the zero carbon energy system from China. So the cooperation is minimal, though both sides are trying to do something. Both sides should be doing even more than they're doing. The other thing is about uh, artificial intelligence governance. As we know, both climate change and AI governance are the global challenges we need to face together. Without China-US cooperation, the rest of the world will be in dismay. So how do you see space for cooperation on this? Well, there is no cooperation on this for a simple reason. The United States is trying to choke off advanced semiconductors to China. This is a, a technology war, a trade war. But this is exactly where there's no cooperation because uh, the U.S. Uh, is, has militarized this uh, or completely uh, some combination of the Pentagon and these big tech companies. But they're trying to keep China out of this. Uh, and so there's no useful diplomacy at all on this right now. It's either a matter of trying to weaponize AI or to stop China by these uh, restrictions, but it's not gonna work. China's making breakthroughs on semiconductors uh, that are very remarkable. Going to you, David, uh, people-to-people relations, uh, just like the other two panelists, that you are absolutely passionate about it between China and the United States. So how to address the question of too uh, few numbers of uh, American students in China? Well, there are still many Chinese students in the U.S. Um, how do you see the prospect of that? in the year 2024? Yes, I think I have a little tidbit of optimism. Uh, I'm in academia, and that's very different than politics. Uh, we don't think so much about current events. We, we think of bigger issues that are timeless. And uh, when you get two academics in a room, of course, they start sharing information and interests uh, you know, openly. Both sides during the pandemic, but even beforehand, but especially now, have, have been wanting more uh, uh, you know, uh, international cooperation, academic exchange. Uh, the US, because uh, of the urgent need we have uh, for, for people who have lived in China and who are what we call China hands. We have, we have Jeffrey Sachs here, we have Susan Thornton. These are two examples. Others might be people like Susan Shirk and Orville Schell. And these are all people who uh, are a resource. They're people who know China, they know it deeply, they can understand and give good advice. I'm worried about the next generation of Americans. Where are the where are the Jeffrey Sachs and and, uh, and Susan Shirks and and uh, and David Moser too? I'm here in Be I'm in Beijing, so it's a little bit different. But so the optimism is that uh, both sides have been waiting to have the doors open again. China has always been open. Just recently, we had Xi Jinping himself saying that his goal for the next five years to, is to bring in or, or, in, or, or to uh, sort of invite 50,000 American students to study in China. When Xi Jinping says that, that opens a lot of doors and also it opens a lot of pocketbooks because now we know we have the funding. And almost as soon as that happened, I've already been approached to take part in a, a, an exchange program for master's students mm -hmm. that, would be, that would be free of charge, no, you know, free uh, tuition, free lodging and so forth, just to try to attract Americans and foreign students here. So I, th I think no matter what happens between US and China, unless there's some enormous unimaginable diplomatic or, or re natural resources crisis or another COVID, I think the academic exchange and in academia is going to, to go full speed ahead for the next few years, no matter what happens. I will be part of that facilitating it, but I, I think that uh, yeah. But one of the problems is what Jeffrey says is that there's a li there's so much fear of China among the average people that it's harder to get Americans here in China than it is to get Chinese people to go to the U.S. to study. You were an American student when you were doing your doctorate degree in China about linguistics decades ago, back in the 1980s. 
at that time, I'm sure, also uh, very few Americans in China. Of course, the momentum has been different compared to then in terms of bilateral relations. But is there something that we can learn from then about step by step building up some kinds of trust, personal interactions and friendship between Chinese and Americans? How are you, you know, how are you trying to communicate with your students, both uh, coming from the U.S. to study in China, or the Chinese students that you are working with right now uh, for their um, uh, understanding about America? Tell me more about that. Well, I'm greatly influenced by my professors at University of Michigan, uh, Oxenberg and Lieberthal, who are very heavy hitters. I think I think a key to handling this, at least it works in academia, is. You can have exchange and cooperation without agreement. Do you understand what I'm saying? We do not have to agree on all the issues to meet in the same room and talk about them and, and to, 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 to do per, uh, exchanges where there is no conflict, with, where there's win-win situations. And I've, I've found that as long as you can keep the win-win situations alive and also to keep the dialogue going, even if we're at loggerheads, then that's a good thing and, and progress can be made. Uh, anyone who's been married knows that you can stay married for a long time without agreeing on a lot of important issues. And I think the same is true of U.S.-China. The problem here is it's not just two people. It's a matter of millions of people and, uh, on either side that need to get, uh, in, you know, interacting with each other. And, you know, I strongly believe, uh, and many people, both Chinese leaders and American leaders have said the same thing. The root of the U.S.-Chinese relationship is the people-to-people -people relationship. And if you don't have that, then that's, that's a, risk, a very deep risk of a Cold War because you simply don't have the investment, the human investment in both the cultures. What is the best way to build more confidence uh, between the two countries, especially between the two peoples? We already hear subscriptions, uh, uh, prescriptions, shall I say, from the three of you. Uh, Susan, now to you, what is the key that... Uh, um, for example, for scholars like you uh, to uh, work on for the year 2024? Well, I think a lot of the things that are very important to do have already been put into motion, actually. I mean, you mentioned that uh, China has made visas for Americans to go to China easier. And I think on the U.S. side, we've done the same and visa processing is back um, up to, a, you know, no wait time, et cetera. I mean, making the travel as easy as possible, putting the flights back on, making it less expensive. It was extremely expensive to travel to China over the last couple of years. So I think that will help a lot, especially with um, students who are looking at going to China. Uh, but also, I mean, we've got to um, do something to make it you know, more uh, fun and less of a security overlay. And one thing that I've talked about is, you know, the kind of uh, travel warnings and things that both sides tend to put out about the other side are, in my view, wildly exaggerated and should uh, be either, um, you know, made to be more realistic or rethought how they are systematized because, um, when I read, you know, these things that people put out about, you know, in China, I hear people telling uh, their kids, you know, don't go to the U.S. There's, you know, shootings on the streets all the time. And in, in the U.S., there's a travel warning that says, you know, don't go to China. They might have an exit ban. I mean, these are not things that happen to very many people. And so mm -hmm. they should not take one case and exaggerate it to make it um, a, a source of fear for people to travel. Right. Um, and I think, you know, other cultural things that we can do, I mean, the ping pong tournament was mentioned back in the early 70s. Um, pandas, you know, are always a big hit um, as far as cultural exchange. And there's just a lot of other things that can be done on the cultural front to, to uh, raise attention to the need to have this exchange continue. Will technology help? Uh or other things. Uh, Susan, uh, what about for you, 45, min 45 years reflection, uh, any moments of earlier history that could be extremely inspirational today? Um, but I think that the moments of real cooperation are the ones that I think of. And so, you know, for me, the things that stand out are 
the efforts um, at the six party talks um, that we did in the 2000s. I was in Beijing for that, trying to get the North Koreans into negotiations on their nuclear program. We, we got pretty far on that. It didn't turn out uh, to work out in the end, of course, as, as all the North Korean negotiations have, but, but that was one thing. And I think also the, the journey from 2009 Copenhagen on the climate change issue to 2015 Paris and all the work that was done uh, between those two. I mean, 2009 was a low point and all the way up to 2015 was, was a high point of US-China cooperation there and really some strategic work to try to make that a success. And I hope we can get back to some things like that where we're actually really cooperating together to accomplish something that is for the good of humanity, really, and, and people in both right. the, both our countries. I'll go back uh, to a trip uh, 30 years ago in 1994. Uh, there was a meeting of young economists in Hainan Island, and we arrived at night. And what was amazing as we took the 40 or 50 minute uh, bus ride to our hotel <clears throat> was the construction in the middle of the night was nonstop everywhere. Uh, hotels uh, were being built, uh, people, workers on the scaffolding in the middle of the night. And we saw uh, what was this uh, incredible economic miracle before our eyes. It, it was China working day and night for this uh, extraordinary mm -hmm. progress. So the second thing that happened is uh, arriving at that conference, I met a lot of young people who 30 years later are China's uh, technocratic leaders. Uh, and I've gotten to know them from their start just out of school to the point where they're uh, national leaders and international leaders of China. And that gives a lot of confidence. These are absolutely uh, dear friends, colleagues for a long time. There's an enormous amount of trust. And for me, this is one of the reasons why I feel all of this tension is so artificial. It's for people that don't know, that haven't had that experience. And then from there, if I may very quickly, just to say we went to Shanghai just after that, and I went to Pudong. At the time, Pudong was flat. There was nothing there. We were taken to a, a little building which had the model of the future of Pudong, and it looked like Manhattan. And I inside said, mm, look outside, there's nothing there. Isn't this a little exaggerated? And of course, 30 years later, that model was exactly what happened. You know, just uh, you watched uh, this incredible dynamic place come to life uh, before one's eyes. So this is 30 years ago for me, uh, both on a personal level uh, and as an economist watching the transformation well, the three of you have already provided wonderful suggestions. I know you are also going to follow uh, those uh, advice that you provided earlier uh, about the importance of two-way communications, um, make it open and accessible for the common folks of both countries, about the importance of having can-do spirit, and also about the significance of bilateral cooperation on global challenges for both of the countries and peoples and for the rest of the world. Thank you so much for the three of you for joining us on the very first day of 2024, which also marks the 45th anniversary of uh, relations between China and the United States. All the best to all of you and to our viewers around the world. Thank you. That's my conversation with three American scholars who have been trying to build relations between China and the U.S. for decades. In the future program of ours, earlier this year, we are going to address more issues between China and the United States in further editions. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Insight on the YouTube channel. And also, you can follow us on X and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of my team. Thanks for being with us. Happy New Year to all of you. I'll see you tomorrow.